Welcome to National Sawdust's Digital Stage. My name is Paola Pristini and I'm the co-founder of National Sawdust and I will be your host today. I would like to describe myself. I'm wearing a black top. My hair is, my blonde hair is in a ponytail um, and I'm a white woman sitting in my bedroom with a green plant in back of me. We here at National Sawdust are broadcasting from the, from the occupied and unceded territory of the Canarsie and Muncie Lenape people who have stewarded this land for generations. This masterclass culminates the work of our Tulman co-fellows, Miriam Parker and Marissa Michelson. The Tulman Fellowship is a partnership between National Sawdust and the Center for Ballet Arts funded by the Tulman Foundation. Each fellow was asked who was their dream mentor and Marissa and Miriam named Yuval and he graciously accepted. Their work was commissioned by this program and it premiered on our digital stage a few weeks back. They have had time with Yuval to discuss their project's creation, and today I'm going to begin talking with Yuval, then Marissa and Miriam will join, and then we'll culminate with questions from our Tulman Creators Lab and Blueprint Fellowship students at Juilliard. But first, a bit about our guest, Yuval Sharon. Yuval Sharon is one of the unique leading minds of our time. His complex, dreamlike visions have altered our global operatic landscape. He's the founder and artistic director of the industry in Los Angeles and the director of Detroit's Michigan Opera Theater. He is the first American ever invited to direct Beirut and was honored with a MacArthur Fellowship and a Foundation Up for Contemporary Art grant for theater. It's a joy for me to welcome my friend Yuval. Yuval, please join me. Hi. Hi, Paola. Great to see you. Thank you so much for being part of this program. It's so meaningful and it's, it's so good to see you. Well, I was very honored to be asked, and uh, it's just incredible to be in dialogue with such creative minds, especially people that are trying to figure out how to stay creative in this crazy period. So um, I feel very enriched by my conversations with Marissa uh, and Miriam through this this whole uh, the, uh, the last few weeks, and um, I'm su super excited to see how their partnership continues to grow. Yeah, me too. So today we're going to start with a little bit of a window into the way you think, which I think is important to then contextualize the conversation um, that the three of you had together over the last couple months. So I really want to begin with the work uh, Sweetland as the kind of focal point of our conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, for those who don't, who haven't seen uh, Sweetland, it actually premiered early last year, right before the shutdown, or yeah, right before the shutdown, it was cut, uh, cut short. Mm -hmm. um, and the work is a real reckoning uh, of American identity and a dismantling of the myths that we were founded on. So I, I, one of the things that I was so fascinated by was the duality of the creative team that, um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that you surrounded yourself with. And it felt so right when dealing with this kind of complex issue of American identity. And it just so, it seems so fitting. So two composers, mm -hmm. two directors, two writers. Um, tell us a little bit about that choice. Uh, the choice, you know, it's it's interesting. It it, it um, in many ways, I wish it was three of everybody or four of everybody because part of the idea behind the multiplicity of viewpoint in the creative team was to try and capture a feeling like there isn't one uh, only one way of telling the truth about history. There's there's multiple uh, there's multiple perspectives on what history is, you know, and of course that's how the project began, and it began actually in the wake of the 2016 election and us trying to think about how do we get back to a to a kind of original sin of American history uh, to grapple with that more than we have in the past and look at the way in which our education and our upbringing uh, continues to, um, you know, pr promote a certain way of thinking about uh, American identity that has left a lot of people out and has left a lot of uh, stories out uh, and often purposefully uh, tried to erase stories. So Sweetland began as a sense of trying to get those stories um, to the surface and uh, and expressed in a way. Um, so so I think it for that it was really it was really crucial for it to be um, multiple perspectives um, for so many reasons. You know we had three of the two directors, two uh, composers, and two librettists. On each of those uh, each of those pairs, one of them um, one member of those pairs was was a was was a native artist uh, uh, that had a, tr a tribal affiliation of some sort, or, or in some cases multiple um, multiple affiliations. And I know that something that was important for them was to get past a kind of pan Indian, so to speak, uh, kind of look at, at, at what uh, indigeneity is in, in America. And that led us overall to try and distance ourselves from too historical of a viewpoint 
um, to try and look at the overall mechanism of, uh, of colonialism right. as it was manifest in America, but then also how that might relate to, um, to other countries and other situations. And so that's why we put it into a bit of a, a, you know, a mythic realm of hosts and arrivals as opposed to uh, uh, Native Americans and pilgrims, uh, because that just felt way too narrow um, and, and uh, fraught with a lot of potential pitfalls. And instead, the, the encounter um, that each of us faced with other perspectives and other points of view really became such a big part of what the whole piece was about. And thinking that as we create this collaboration with with uh, you know with six different creative team members, you know we often mentioned this, the creative team members, but there was also a huge team of designers, a large cast. We had we had a ton a ton of collaborators, right? And and the the real goal was to try and make it a piece in which we could all see ourselves in it, you know. Um, uh, and and that was um, that was a, a really inspiring and an eye opening experience for me personally as 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 the as the white male on the team. Uh, this was a this was a this was a really eye eye opening experience that I think actually prepared me very well psychically for all of the reckoning that we saw um, in the wake of the last year. Right, uh, it almost felt prescient um, to to everything that happened. And I guess you know we have a lot of composers on the on the on the mm -hmm. Zoom today, and I wonder if you can actually um, demyth a bit the process of what it means. I mean, as you said, there's a much larger team than six people. There's you know multiple, multiple creative minds, but really starting with those six, to walk us through a little bit what that process of timelining look like, looks like. Sure. Like foregrounding of ideas and that kind of, I mean, I also, I just want to say that I think what's so fabulous about the choice of, of Raven and and, uh, and Duyun is that both of them really have such, uh, how do I say it, such a deep understanding of different cultural makeups and an, an understanding also um, of the rigor it takes to, to kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes in terms mm. of musical uh, landscapes. Um, yeah. And also so that, you, you know, in terms of conversations we've been having about appropriation, I feel like they're the perfect, uh, the perfect um, storytellers, if you will, yeah. in such a delicate way. Well, I felt so too, and and I think to your question of timeline, in many ways, um, in you know, it be in process, yeah, in general. So, but I mean, I, it really did. It was kind of a piece at a time. I think it really did actually start with Raven because I was really, uh, really taken by Raven's music and um, his his noise, his work with with noise, and his work with uh, with an with a visual art collective that he was part of uh, called uh, Post Commodity, and so I knew that he was thinking in a way, in this kind of interdisciplinary way. And so I felt that that he had a natural um, inroad into opera potentially, or, you know, certainly not maybe classical opera, but, um, you know, the kind of experimental opera that the industry has been doing. Um, he felt, he felt, uh, he felt connected uh, to where I wanted, the musical language that I wanted us to go. And then it became about sort of pairing him. And over the course of time, it just, what, what drew me to Duyan is not just her absolutely um, amazing uh, imagination, yeah. you know, and uh, her incredible ability to, uh, to, to, you know, to think in, in such large scale, um, which I, I feel like I, I very much share with her. Mm -hmm. um, I actually felt that Duyan and Raven, as, as, in, as distinct as they were, had a lot of overlaps, you know, um, in terms of also their interest in improvisation, their interest right. in noise, their, their creative process actually you know, it's unique creative processes, but it but it certainly opens up so much room for the individual uh, uh, interpreter of the work to actually shape the work. And I thought that that I, I just felt like that was a conversation that was going to be incredibly rich and meaningful. And, and it turned out to be the case. Um, but in terms of timeline, I have to say that I basically approach every single project I do working backwards from saying when when roughly do we want to do this, you know, right. Um and thinking that at that and and that changes sometimes based on how the piece evolves. But in some cases, it's saying, let's say that we want to do this in in two years for the industry. We do a new piece every two years. So we just think, OK, the, the project that we want to do in two years time, you know, instead of thinking, let's let's think about the big picture and then uh, just uh, and, and not and get trapped in that, which is what what, what happened to me. And I, I think I mentioned this to, to Marissa at one point in, in our in our conversations um, is that, you know, it's it's always the the collection of tiny little victories that you need to make to get to this big picture you know it's like having the big picture in mind is useful but but working backwards you realize there's there's a little thing that you could do today 
right. which seems like a little drop in the bucket. But, you know, when you do that and you just keep doing that before you know it, you're doing something at a scale that you maybe dreamed of, but maybe didn't expect that you'd actually be able to, to, to do. So and that's so, a great philosophy on life in general. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. I think so too. It's like the one step, the one, you know, like the, you know, the path of a thousand of a thousand miles begins with the ground under your feet kind of approach, which is, you know, and it's true. It's like, but, but, but the, the, that thousand, that thousand mile path is also important. What's it, what, you know, roughly where are you hoping to, to, to land? Where is your destination? It, it doesn't have to be super specific, but, but having that in mind has always been helpful for me because then I think I can feel more at ease with realizing that, you know, today it's just going to be this, uh, this square feet in front of me. And that's and it. And had you, you know, worked so. with each of, uh, each of these collaborators? No, they were all new, all new people. So mm -hmm. finding also that kind of common dialogue takes time. It takes time. It takes time. I think it takes a lot of care anyway, but under the circumstances that we were in, took, an, took, an, took a special amount of care and a special amount of making sure that that every, and I think this is also something that I, I learned during this process and I, I do now hold as a real, um, as a real goal for collaborations that I want to undertake, which is, you know, everybody who's part of it, there's an interdependence that I think we reach. That's a, a great kind of John Cage word is uh, interdependence, which is notion of it's not independence. No one's independent and certainly not me as the director. I'm very, very reliant on everyone doing their part, you know? <laughs> right. So, um, so there's, I, I sometimes get a little bit uneasy when there's, um, when there's too much of an emphasis on any one particular player. And certainly when it's me, I, pre I feel really uneasy because, you know, there's nothing that can, there's nothing I do on my own. You know, every single thing I do, is in collaboration with everybody. And yet, I don't think, and this is also a topic that, that Miriam and Marissa and I talked about quite a bit, you know, I do think that the ideal collaboration, and maybe collaboration is not quite the best word for what it is that we're exploring, but the ideal collaboration, I'll use that for now, just because that seems to be the best word, um, allows everyone to maintain um, an enormous amount of autonomy that we're still recognizable in the work that we don't lose ourselves in 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 the final project, you know, right. uh, because then you then you just get kind of a mud, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, an indistinctness. And I actually think what we really want is interdependence. So we're we're all reliant on each other. And yet we do stand on our own feet. I love so that. There's a non-human collaborator, right? Which is, I think, <laughs> always present in all of your works, which is a sense of place. And in this case, mm. it was the LA State Historic Park. And mm. you said that it really formed a type of dialogue, right? With the mm. work, um, mm -hmm. which I loved. And to talk a little yeah. bit about your relationship to, to place and to yeah. physicality and what that does to transform the way you, you know, the way you envision things. Sure, okay. sure. I mean, um, it's, it's very, um, it's it's undergoing an interesting process as we think about place in such different ways, and certainly Sweetland was was a a big eye opener in, in this for me too. You know, I think we prior to Sweetland we did a number of projects that um, approached place kind of differently. You know, um, um, I, I thought of you know a lot of these projects took place in Los Angeles, and so Los Angeles is a, is a site of a lot of fiction. You know, where even the world around us is kind of all a Hollywood backdrop, right? right. And um, I think a piece like Hol like, uh, like Hopscotch, uh, Invisible Cities and War of the Worlds kind of played with the fictionality of our reality and um, wanted to explore that and trying to think about how the opera offers one fictional layer onto a true site and into a true environment. But I think that as, um, as I got to know LA better, and also as I was thinking about Sweetland and thinking about what we wanted to achieve with Sweetland, I think that um, it, well, there was a different relationship uh, in mind with that, which is the LA State Historic Park is kind of, you know, if you, if you did a cross section of the soil, you would see all of the layers of, of American history in that soil. And, you know, the, the notion that that was the most important Tongva village uh, you know, uh, at that, you know, for, for, for such a long time and, and, and located at such an important geographic crossroads, um, which then became um, the Spanish Pueblo, which then became the railroad, you know, which then was kind of abandoned as an industrial, as a kind of industrial wasteland that they thought nothing could grow on it again. And it actually was an artist who came in and, um, and showed that uh, actually you can clear all that away and the land can come back 
uh, but in but you know you have to give it that space, you know. And um, after that, it's now a state park. Yeah, but so but it's also, yeah, it's such a metaphor that an artist would aid that transformation. That's incredible. And then that you, of course, chose that as this kind of site for you know the the expression of of, of these themes. Yeah, and I think for us, I think kind of similar to so the artist uh, who 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 had. Uh, who kind of reclaimed that space sort of uh, in her in her own way but not for herself but just for for nature really with her name was lauren bond and she did oh, a project I love lauren she's yes amazing. She's, yes so she did all the amazing work with the la river exactly so yeah. before she was doing this la all all this incredible work with the water wheel and the la river she took that parcel of land and she made it for one um, cycle of seasons, she created a cornfield there because it's kind of mythically known as a cornfield, even though th there's no historical record that corn ever grew there. Right. But, you know, she she found a way to kind of clear away all that industrial, well, not all the industrial debris. We still found remnants of the train, uh, of the trains from when we right. were there doing this opera. Um, but um, she cleared as much of that away as possible. And within one season, corn, big, tall stalks of corn were growing there. And it was such an incredible, it was incredible. such an incredible work that that was all about the earth, you know, and all about right. the land. And also about our mis misconception of our relationship to the land, you know, as, um, as, 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 you know, as, as uh, the, um, <laughs> the beneficiaries, I guess we should say, of um, so much violence and so much um, so much displacement and so much um, uh, so much erasure. So that's what you know. So there, this notion of trying to unravel that and trying to undo all of that, I do think art art can help in that process. I don't think art can do it, but what art can do, I think, is and it's certainly an opera. You know, an opera is not going to um, is not going to solve these problems, but what it can what it can do is invite us onto the land and invite us into a deeper, slower relationship with this land, you know, where we're not just jogging through it as the people do now, you know, right, but right. actually to take time and, and sit on the ground, you know, and smell the air and feel cold there and feel the wind and, um, and look out at a part of the park that is kind of half built, you know, and thinking about all of that. So, so like the opera, and this is something that that actually really is difficult for me. I've talked about this a bit also with Marissa and Miriam, that the the film of Sweetland that we had to do under quite a bit of duress because we, you know, didn't didn't really plan to do it, but we thought it was a it was a a, a last ditch effort to try to save this piece before it was uh, lost right. forever. Um, to COVID, <laughs> so um, so we did film it, and I'm very proud of the film of it because everyone did a great job, and everyone was terrified. You know, we didn't know what was going on, but we we nevertheless pulled together and, and got that film done. But um, you know, the the land was a central character, and that can't that does not come through in the video at all. So um, so it so it's um, it's interesting how these uh, you know I, I think you're absolutely right that 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 was a character of that piece and i do want to keep seeing certainly opera but I, I just keep thinking about taking music taking performance taking you know dance taking everything out of these prescribed uh frames that we're so used to seeing them in it's so it, it's so interesting because like i think over the, the course of this past year you know one of the biggest practices has been listening you know and it's also mm. the reawakening of nature and so it's, mm. it's interesting to see and, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on you know mm. how how these things that we've learned how this listening um you know which is i think has occurred for so many of us how that how that transforms artistic practice um yeah. I think there are positive things it's just it's just been with with uh with so much complexity mm -hmm. i have a million things i want to ask you but i just want to show um our audience two of the photos from sweetland and then i'm gonna ask sure. you a question and we'll move into our second part of this uh of this talk so let's uh, let's maybe let people know mm -hmm. what we're watching what we're seeing yes this is sharon kim playing the role of windigo and um you know, I think this gives you a sense. Uh, Chanupa Hanska Luger, who is both the co-director and one of the costume designers, created this costume. Uh, and I think it, you know, in many ways, Windigo was a kind of a, um, you know, it, it's in many ways was one of the central characters because uh, she sort of, she sort of conveyed all of the um, uh, the the doom laden future <laughs> that was about to uh, to come to this uh, to to this particular story um 
a, a kind of a bringer of chaos, uh, someone who enjoys the chaos and, um, and a figure of that, of that darkness, um, which I thought was um, so beautifully conveyed by a singer who was not singing normal operatic kind of, um, kind of uh, sung language, but really um, would, would go into crazy extended techniques and um, sound manipulation through, uh, through, through amplification and, and all kinds of, all kinds of wild, um, all kinds of wild sounds that she would make. But I think that, um, she, yeah, she was in many ways a, uh, a really, a really central image, I think, of this, uh, of this opera. She was one of the only characters who went uh, across both tracks of the train and the, and the feast track. So, um, and yeah, that's her. Oh yeah, that's that's the backside of Windigo with the teeth. <laughs> so this notion that Windigo is is a devouring presence, you know, and somebody who is just eating and eating and eating and has a mouth on both sides of her body was kind of the the idea there. Um, right. was a, a, yeah, great and terrifying creature. And then and the the other two that um, that sang along with her are these two coyotes. There's one coyote that's Carmina Escobar uh, in the foreground. And Michaela Tobin, the coyote that's a bit in the background, but the two of the two of them almost form like one one body. And again, the coyote as a as a kind of iconic mythic trickster figure, you know, uh, in 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 Native American, um, uh, you know, thinking um, and in storytelling, you know, the coyote is very much this this fantastic uh, fantastic trickster. Um, and for us, they operated also as a kind of trickster figure between the opera and the audience, I think. They kind of serve as a bridge between these worlds. And similarly, and, and Raven in particular was was really keen on, on both of these singers because they both have an incredible improvisational um, uh, practice, vocal practice. Yes. And um, having that freedom, that kind of wild freedom that was also part of the set uh, text of the opera, um, I think contributed to some of the, um, the the instability that was so crucial for us for 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 Sweetland, but also I think some of the some of the dazzling sounds uh, that were that were so unique for this particular for this particular project. These are amazing. So we are going to introduce our our two fellows, and um, I have so many more questions, but I will I will loop them in with the four of us because I think there's going to be a beautiful a beautiful dialogue and. Um, Let's see, I'm going to actually, uh, let's bring them on and then I'll tell everybody a little bit about them. Uh, let's join us, uh, Miriam Parker and Marissa Michelson. There they are. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Thank you for having us. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to introduce both of you and then and then we can just dive in. So uh, starting with Miriam, your dance and choreography practice layers many elements to create a seamless interdisciplinary language. Uh, you create installations, video, and movement designs, and you perform, and your work has been presented at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the White Box Art Center. And I read somewhere that one of your greatest accomplishments of your career has actually happened during the pandemic, which I love and I think is such an inspiring thing, so we're going to get back to that. And uh, Marisa, as a composer and singer, improvisation and the body is at the core of what you do in terms of your writing and your work with your ensemble, Constellation Core. And with the core, you made your Lincoln Center debut performing uh, Ashfur's Filament with the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Japon Sved. Um, your own musical uh, musicals and oratorios um, have earned drama desk nominations, and much more. So the three of you um, have worked together, but I first want to start actually with the Marissa and Miriam and how you two found each other and what were some of the discoveries and challenges. And then I'd love to talk, you know, just get right into the flow of the three of you and some of your findings during the past couple of months. But first, how you met. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I like to tell this story because I, I discovered Miriam and um, <laughs> we, we actually met in a shared meditation center environment in New York, a community called Three Jewels, where Miriam is a meditation teacher. And I was uh, taking a, a Buddhism course and was very intrigued by Miriam's teaching and presence and, and then looked up her work and found a kind of kinship with mine and I felt in particular immediately upon watching some of 
some of Miriam's videos and dance, like a reaction inside of me, kind of like a feeling space that felt to me through the screen, like what I want humans to experience when they see and hear Constellation Core live. And so there was a kind of like, kind of magical realism and textural space that was so evocative. And um, so I reached out to Miriam to work together. And that's the, that's, that's it. Amazing. And mm -hmm. uh, Miriam, I have to say when I, when I've seen your work, it reminds me in a very different sense, but of some of the, I think I mentioned this to you in our lab of um, some of the early films of Anais Nin and this kind of mm. unbelievable kind of surreal quality of the films is, is really special. Um, mm. We of you have talked a little bit, um, I'm sure about some of the challenges of working in this medium, how to capture ephemerality in this, in this form. I wonder if you can just walk our, you know, our, our listeners and our audience through some of your, some of the things that you've discussed in terms of ephemerality and digital performance, time, um, challenges. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I, I've been, I would start this was one of my curiosities has been um, before we were forced upon us to place our work in a digital realm. I've been very interested to do that because of um, trying to find a space and where I could work with the different mediums with a bit more uh, equanimity. And so having, you know, the platform in which something is seen, the plate in which you place something which enables it to rise up and be visible is very indicative of how somebody experiences it and the whole um, experience for the vi um, viewer and for the performer. And through history, the way that different mediums are seen are very much start to create uh, distances between these mediums, you know, like the street performer versus the opera, which traditionally was in this niche and, and the dance was in this niche. So um, this uh, interest to, to how do we find um, an equal playing ground, but at the same time, what does it look like to still, as, as, um, as, as Yuval said, like, how do we keep our anonymity or our individual voice? And is it a true collaboration, even if we started off an idea and for me and Marissa, it ended up a bit like we were in two different, we had two different studios across from each other and um, really worked within our team to create what we were supposed to create. But it wasn't like this traditional, um, relationship where everything is intertwined it was like right. a very modern kind of relationship where each player was very independent and I think for me there was some insecurity about that like kind of is it truly am I giving enough or it, the question that you can actually there's a good parallel between actual relationships and collaborations mm -hmm. in terms of negotiation of of space, you know, how do we share space? And so it was, you know, very, very sweet to me to have that kind of struggle and contemplation in a time where we were invited to by not just our own colleagues in our art world, but by a larger structure system to relook at these structures that we were taking for granted. And um, it was great to be caught off balance like that and feel frustrated and nervous because as an artist or as a Miriam, <laughs> I do like to be in control, <laughs> you know? I, there is that kind of like this, it's so important, the world, like what we do, our time is important. How I spend it is important. I do not want to waste anybody's time. So like, let's get to it right away. So. There was, it was, it was, that was one of the things that I enjoyed to speak um, as a, as a coming together and, and, and learning and listening from you all and having a place for me and Marissa actually could speak uh, outside of the immediacy of creation. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. There's mm -hmm. so much there. Um, there's so much in, in what you just said. And I think there's two places that I, I want to go to. One is that um, I think I mentioned to the three of you that a good friend of mine who's a director named Ashley Tata mentioned that in her work, you know, one of the things she realized in this digital realm is that you almost have to recreate the architecture every time you have a performance um, of who's on the other side. And I'm curious hmm. you know, for the three of you, how you're thinking about, there's two parts to this question. One, you know, your audience and, and establishing an audience in, in this kind of new way, which Miriam, I think relates really interestingly to what you were saying about different audiences being, you know, so separate. And all of a sudden now, because this is our only mode of communication, we're almost all living in the same stream. That's one thing. Um, and two, how you, you all brought up the most interesting thing about, you know, how, how can we, how can we find space when this mode of communication is also such a distraction? And I think that's like such an interesting, um, you know, so, so if any of you want to answer this question of audience and, and the architecture of the audience, and then um, this idea of, um, you know, of space in these very complex modes of communication. Hmm. Yuval, do you want to take one of them? I'll start. I'll start, and then maybe uh, I, because actually, quite honestly, I don't. I have not figured it out, but uh, <laughs> Mar Mar Marissa and Miriam have because I think their work was extraordinary, <laughs> um, and I think it works so well for the digital for a digital platform, you know. And um, I, you know, I'm very. I was so taken by it because I feel like they actually embraced what the medium could do, um, and I think that. You know, to to something that Miriam said that I that I um, that I really resonate with is you know there's also sometimes and it kind of relates how to your to your question about timeline. You know, there's also always the sense of you do have to create um, a sandbox somehow, right? You know, uh, for you to play in, and there's there are limits that you have to work in, and I think that there are some, there's sometimes a lot of value to um, creating some really really strange limits. You know, on on mm -hmm. what you think. Uh, might might be inhibiting or might be different from your usual mm -hmm. practice. But that's something that can actually inspire you to try something that might totally transform your practice in a way you could not have anticipated otherwise. I think mm -hmm. that that does happen with collaboration. I think it does happen with, with working together with other people because in a way you do have to create new boundaries yeah. um, and, and have to work in relation to something else, right? And that, that can be really yeah. useful and really, really helpful. But um, I think the two of them really have figured out the digital aspect in a way that, that, I, that I actually feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm further behind after this year uh, you know, than I was prior because I, 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 I don't know where I stand with, with digital work. But when I see the work that they, that they did, I feel like, oh yeah, there's, there's so much potential there. Hmm, that's so kind. Um, I, the thing that I, I feel like I could just speak to, and this actually overlaps with your question originally about challenges and um, one of the things that we try, we aimed to do at the beginning was this question of how to bring, how to bring the singing body alive in a digital space. Right. And we explored some things and in our post project talks, we feel like we were successful in a few ways and have a long way to go in some other inquiries around this particular question. And um, what we didn't want to do was just kind of video us singing, like just have that as like some sort of there we are singing and you hear us, but we also didn't want to have it just be like a music video. Um, we wanted something in between. And there are a few moments from our piece that, that remain with me, like um, a moment where my mouth is open and there's this long tone happening and the, it really does feel to me watching it like, like I am hearing, hearing myself singing and that it feels embodied in that way. But it's also the mouth is moving huge towards the screen and then you see Miriam's body inside. And so to me, that's a moment where we were, simul we were simultaneously able to kind of 
um, sync up the the sound with the singing and like give a kind of embodied experience, but also go deeper into what the digital realm has to offer, like what's inside of that sound? Like what's what's bringing that sound to life? Is it Miriam dancing? How do we interact? Um, so that was a successful moment from my perspective. And then something else is that in the third section, we, we watch the ensemble, we watch the different people moving and singing. And um, actually, I think you'll play a little part of this, but I, I compose the music in these long phrases that kind of trail off and trail off again and again in sync with individual singers' actual exhales, like the actual length of their breath. And in those moments, what I would like to do in the future is to, in order to bring like an improvisational practice into this space, like what we do live, is um, have those more, more silent moments, like have the actual sound from the film of the breathing of the movers, of the improvising of the movers that was happening actually in space when they were being filmed. Um, and kind of bring together this composed music with these improvisational sounds that are literally happening in the video space, but are not necessarily coming from the music, but coming from the space that they're in as we film the same thing again and again. And that like spatial sound, like kind of to, to try to create a type of spatial sound even within the, the, the oral experience. Yeah, and particularly of them singing, of them making sounds with their voices and putting those together with the composition. Very cool. Well, mm -hmm. let's set up what we're about to watch um, and, then, uh, and then we'll continue talking. So I don't know, uh, Miriam, do you want to set up what we're about to watch, the two clips? I think you're on mute. <laughs> I, I've, I'm a little bit, I'm um, not sure exactly. I believe that one clip we're watching is in the finale of the work in progress in which you're witnessing the, the core sort of emerging, the mechanics of what you're watching is the core emerging from Marissa's back. Okay. Um, but what it looks like is something it, very different. It's all good. We'll watch both and then we'll, we'll contextualize it on the back end. Huh? <gasps> 
Amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about what we just saw. Okay, now I know what we saw. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Tell us a little bit. All right. So the the first clip is what I call like the middle section, and it's the moment of emergence. And it was um, the way I work in in I don't know. I'd like to think there is a similarity with Evolver. I'm very site specific, so. Um, my wish is to create installations that I then use as an instrument to play with. So uh, we'll have I'll have a con con concept that I'll then discuss with the materiality. So we created a space that had um, elements of different textures, sand being one that you'll see, and um, mylar, which is a reflective material. And so we this this section was really like this exchange of one inhale and exhale like the emergence and then the intake of a moment in a way like i um this is like we have this idea that i'm breathing my breath mm. this is my breath yeah it's not your breath <laughs> you know this is my breath. Anyway, so this idea of ownership of space and, and the material the materiality of how much can we stretch that materiality of the self and, and start to have a different scope of view. That is my interpretation. What you're seeing is uh, a lot of editing, a lot of editing and work with materials and a lot of layering. So there's about four different layers that you're seeing there. Um, some footage from my archival stuff from my time in uh, Jordan, actually, of the mountains that you're seeing through my body. And then the second clip, um, so I, I have different relics or items that mean something to me that I, I explore and start to carry into different work. So rope is something that I've been working with. And so experimenting how with the language of rope and the language of, of that what we can do as a um, as as a um, meaning meaning what it can mean in our work. So you're seeing the core really improvising with entanglement with themselves and with nature. And then I just invited one of the uh, members to try to untangle and then tangle herself up. Yeah. And then. Um, you're seeing more and more layers. And the last section I will, will tell you is, I didn't have enough material for the last section. I actually did not have enough. You're against the wall. Yeah, so I was like, all right, I don't know what to do. I need like something that's a little bit lyrical, like to ground some of the m m timing wise. Yeah. So I found uh, a street um, background and I was like, all right. And I did it in one take. So that was like eight minute improv and it worked out so that was good I, it's so interesting because i you know i really think about like how our processes have been so challenged during this time you know and yet i think you've all about what you said in terms of like you know just like a new per person a new collaborator can completely shift um the way you think it's it's forced everybody to improvise in a way that's um that that i think has refined uh, collaborative processes in really interesting ways, and I don't know if um, if anyone wants to comment on that. Um, but but there are actually three questions for each of you, so we can we can also take those. But if, is there is there anything anything lingering on your minds before we dive into questions? All right. All right. Well, let's bring them on because they will they will keep digging into the work that we've just seen. We're going to take. Um, 
let's invite on uh, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Hi, um, thank you guys so much for um, talking about your work. And I have a question for you all. I was wondering, because sort of your work, um, Sweetland has sort of, it deals with important topics with like American history and conflicts and trauma, collective trauma, like, were there any difficult or challenging decisions you have to make during the production and how were they sort of worked around? No, it was pretty easy. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, it was pretty amazing to think about every single decision carried with it. Um, a lot of significance. And that was actually one of the things that was fantastic about having multiple um, collaborators uh, to talk about what is what is the significance of doing this as opposed to doing that? Because in the end, you know, I mean, in, in the end, all art making is, is, is making decisions, right? I mean, it's like, you've got to get to the place where you say it's gonna be this and not that. And as soon as you make that decision, you are cutting off a path that the, that the work could have taken. And I think that that's something that I think about a lot because um, in my ideal scenario, you you're 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 uh, keeping the work as uh, as up in the air as you possibly can with as many potential readings, but and yet you do have to make decisions to make it as specific as, as you can. And so, and so um, in the case of Sweetland, as you mentioned, because of all of its historical background and and and, and historical implications. You know, every single decision had the had the possibility of triggering who knows what, and um, and so that that was part of what was fantastic about having uh, a group of people um, to to think about every single thing, including things that seem so simple, like staging wise, like at what point does the Makwa character um, unsheath her knife? You know, if she does it this early, are we leaning into uh, images of indigeneity that are violent? Um, and unduly violent, you know? And if we do it too late, are we leading into uh, a kind of idea of, um, uh, of, of victimhood that we don't wanna get across? So, so every, single, every single thing that seems like a simple staging um, challenge, of course, um, you know, costumes, I mean, you know, Chinupa, uh, you know, with, the, with, the, with, um, with all of us really talked a lot about what regalia meant and what, what it would mean to create a regalia that looked kind of indigenous, but was no not connected to any one particular um, tribe. And I think that's also a, a constant, a constant negotiation, you know, and, um, and, and so I think I think being open to that and realizing that there are no quick answers to the kind of stuff that we were talking about. And there was a lot of room for error. And certainly, for me, I know I, I you know, I stepped in error all the time, you know, um, and and just learned 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 from them each and every time, and said, okay, well, that is, that is my uh, that that that's the product of my uh, upbringing, you know, now manifesting itself in the way that I'm talking about this character. So I need to dismantle that. I need to undo that, you know, and probably probably for me more than anyone was uh, was was part of the part of the learning of that particular process. So I think I think the patience to realize that. Uh, and, and the and the the humility to know that you don't have the answers, you know. Um, I think that humility was shared with with everyone that was part of the project. Thank you. I think from that I heard sort of a sense of tension between like leaving things ambiguous and which is like kind of artistic in some way, like it's sort mm -hmm. of, a of art versus sort of having to make definite decisions, which yes. is more like political in a sense, like what political messages you're trying to bring. Yeah, and all mm -hmm. relevant. But yeah, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, that's a really great way to put it because you know, obviously, we were all motivated by by pretty. I mean, if not, if maybe political is the wrong word, but certainly socially, socially motivated uh, um, ideas. But it is true that as soon as they become too clear, um, it does take it out of the realm of of an artistic universe that you're trying to invite the audience into, and starts to become a kind of a uh, you know a, a poster. For the for for a particular mentality, and I think also trying to walk those lines. I can give one quickly. I'll give one very concrete example. Um, in a, if from the move from one scene to another, a number of the characters had white bags on their heads, and it was you know left kind of ambiguous as to what those white bags were about, who put them there. Um, but at one point, they were pretty pointy hoods, and that that I, I would say veered us much closer into one very clear direction for who this ensemble of people were. Suddenly they became kind of avatars of the KKK. 
And, um, and that felt too reductive and that felt too small. And so we had to kind of take it a step back and say, well, but we are interested in this kind of masking and this covering of, 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 of faces. And so they became kind of white bags with corners and suddenly took on a bunch of other new, new, um, new um, perspectives and new, uh, new ideas connected to it. But um, yeah, there's, that's, that's what I, that is true. What I mean about a constant negotiation between what takes it into the realm of it's only one thing and then becomes just a message. And maybe sometimes that's really important. You know, I mean, there's a couple moments in uh, Marissa and Miriam's work where I was quite startled that language suddenly came in, you know, and suddenly there was a, suddenly there was text, you know, and then the text was also mirrored in the visual imagery. So there was this, this oh, there was so much freedom between the different uh, arts that were happening. And then all of a sudden there was the moment where they all synced up. And, and, and actually sometimes moments like that are, are quite wonderfully startling. Um, and so, so trying to think about the, the balance between those things is, is pretty, is pretty, is, is part, it's just the process, I think. So Sophia is writing a work for us for next season as part of our Blueprint Fellowship. So hopefully everyone watching will check it out. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. <laughs> See you soon. Um, next up, we have Sia. Sia is also part of the Blueprint Fellowship at Juilliard. Um, and she has a question for Marissa and Miriam. they'll join us. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is that I really in your works, I really could see like, all the different mediums coming together like music, film, dance, but also what was striking for me is the texture is also taking huge part as a separate a different medium so I really wanted to like hear more about um your your choices in different textures like what um you know be like de what's the deciding factors about that and then yeah yeah <laughs> yeah do you mean you mean the visual and the musical textures, the layers, or are you specifically um, referring to the visual textures? Maybe more about the visual textures. And yeah. then, yeah, I've, because like the visual texture, I felt like it's really the glue of everything, glues everything together. And it was, yeah. Yeah. So I'll let Miriam can take that. Thank you, Sia, for your question. You're giving me an opportunity to sink my teeth into a question that uh, was very important. Uh, it was the textural element is very important to me and it comes in like a portal because how do you create dimension and depth in a two dimensional space? How do I, how do I work with darkness and have it be rich? you know, and so the textures and reflection and light. So light interacts with textures in very different way. Certain light, if it hits certain textures will absorb it and other, other textures will reflect part of it. It will all of a sudden you'll have sides. So um, the use of texture allowed me to have depth in, in, within the color. And that was something that I specifically wanted to explore in this work as um, the underneath uh, conversation was, for me was, uh, and for like, we came together on the point of how do two things meet? How does something emerge, right? So my translation into the visual and physical realm became about subject composition. How do things come together to make something appear? So the idea of supporting roles within a composition and, and texture was very important and materiality allows something to appear in a certain way and give it a life, which I have to say is part of the, my joy in working in different mediums is like looking at, so studying color as a way to understand movement, for example. You can look at a painting of a man or woman or a person 
on top of a hill that's colored green and maybe blue and yellow, that hill. And it appears that the man, them person is moving without actually moving. So how is it that you have a sense of movement in a still moment? It's like light and color. It's just those, those little finite movements. And that, and I find, so I study stillness in order to create motion um, because uh, it doesn't always work. If I want something to move fast and I just move my body fast on the screen, it, you don't have a sense of time passing. There is maybe, it looks like a struggle if I'm running in place. So it's very interesting what you think will read in a certain way doesn't always. So you start to learn like, how do I, do I speak about color and emergence of, of form? Well, it ends up, light is very helpful and texture is very helpful. So that's why that happened. And I'm looking forward to understanding that more and use it, using that more. That is a great question, Sia, and there's so many parallels to what Miriam just said, to, to composition, to silence, to, I, I look forward to unpacking those gems, Miriam. Thank you, Sia. We have one last question, and it beautifully sums up this conversation, so we're going to bring on Forrest, um, and this is a question for the three of you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, Thank you all for your very insightful discussion. It's been an honor to listen to it from this end. Um, of course, we all know that this past year has seen a lot of creativity in the responses of artists, musicians, curators, you know, the list goes on to the demands of social distancing. And one thing I've noticed in particular is that um, live streaming and um, other video forms, as we've discussed, seem to have been bolstered as a really you know, essential practice across a wide variety of artistic and especially musical institutions. Um, so as a composer, I wanted to ask, as we gradually return to our former business of serving in-person audiences, um, what do you think we can learn from our experiences adapting programming for this asynchronous, you know, socially distanced world that we're in at the moment? I think the composer should respond next. <laughs> it's my feelings. It's, uh, okay, okay. For it. Thank you for it. music. Yeah, Throwing I mean, you under the bus. <laughs> I mean, the you know what I was going to say is that the first thing that occurs to me is just um, allowing myself uh, as the leader of Constellation Core and as a singer and live performer who loves that that medium so much and loves experiencing music live to be always open-minded to um, not be attached to the specific form necessarily, but to see, because honestly, go, doing, doing this experience has shown me that there are ways to, to bring alive the work that we do through this medium. Personally, for, for me and for us, I imagine a, a hybrid of live performance with video, which is not new, that's been done for a long time, but I, I know myself now I have a better understanding of the direction that we want to go. And um, the, <laughs> yeah, maybe something that, that I will say that I, I think about myself is when Bjork said something like, if there's not a uh, if there's not soul, if someone thinks there's not soul inside of the machine, it's because a human being didn't actually put it there, and that's how I have been felt feeling about this process of putting the music into this computer realm and accepting the fact that people might listen to it on their phones is some sort of like intentional trust that its aliveness will still speak and I'm excited to continue to pursue both but never giving up the live part as well of course yeah, yeah thank you for that response especially thinking of it as a, a lesson of attachment in various mm. different ways that's a really mm. nuanced way to look at it I think mm. Mm. well Miriam any any parting thoughts um 
Um, I think people will be very appreciative to see us live. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, I look forward to um, that exchange. There's nothing like experiencing the presence of our being together. And um, during this time, I've never felt more needed. Mm. The arts are needed. People need to see magic and something transform. Mm. Because, and so I, I feel like the attention and the way that people are listening in person opposed to on screen is with a new appreciation. So, mm. um, that's wonderful. We I, we are needed. Whether the funding is totally in t up to uh, in sync with my uh, um, optimism, <laughs> I hope it follows. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Forrest, so much. And uh, that feels like a beautiful place to bring this conversation to. Uh, mm. I just want to thank the three of you for. Um, you know, for making, well, first of all, for spending time with me today and with all of our listeners. Uh, we're going to put in uh, the social media worlds uh, the link to uh, Marissa and Miriam's piece and also um, to Sweetland so people can, um, can watch that whole experience uh, there as well. And I look forward to seeing the three of you um, in the flesh one day soon. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.